really thank you for coming. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. It's an honor to be here. And, and that's the first thing on the recording. It's my you're welcome. So here we are. Shall we begin? Yes. You can turn to Colossians chapter 2 on your iPhones, iPads, and Bibles. Or you could just hear it if you didn't bring it. That's fine, no problem. And I'm going to open with a word of prayer, actually. So, God is good. Thank you, Lord, for this wonderful gathering, for this circle of, of friends and saints of the Most High God purchased with the blood of Jesus and granted and filled with the Holy Spirit. We thank you for your love toward us. We just pause a moment and we remember how much you love us, Father, that your Son would lay down his life for us, that you would grant us the Holy Spirit and shed abroad your love in our hearts. Thank you, Father, for that. And we pray tonight that you would really rise up within us and you would be present powerfully in our midst, God. We know that you already are, but that we would really sense your presence and you would make your words known to us. We pray for that spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you so that in our inner person, we would really see the mysteries of Christ and of the kingdom and of all that that means practically for our lives and for this wonderful work that you're planting. Lord, we pray that you would do your work. Miriam thought you were the gardener, but you were the risen Lord. And yet you are one who tends your garden. In some sense, you're a gardener planting the plantings of the Lord, according to Isaiah, that you might be glorified. And I pray that this would be a planting of the Lord, that you would prepare the soil and you'd provide the nutrients and the, the guidance and the outward frame as this plant grows and just have your way, accomplish your will and uh, establish a work in this city and county and be glorified. May your gospel be revealed, trumpeted on a whole new level in this area. May this area of our uh, nation be, uh, become a testimony of the grace and power of Jesus Christ. And, and do that, may we be a contribution to that in partnership with you, even those in this room, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So in Colossians chapter 2, there's this passage beginning in verse 6 uh, that I have used recently as kind of a template for a church work. I felt like... The, Paul was using some images there that are helpful for us to gauge some different stages of a church plant. So I thought that would be appropriate to talk about here. I'm not saying he's fully doing that on purpose. Maybe just the images lend themselves to that. Um, but I think it's useful still to see this passage as a bit of a grid and a template. So, um, so I'm going to take it step by step. I'm going to identify four stages <clears throat> and when I do, it's not like a very serious, systematic, four-stage process, like this is absolutely the only way it can be. I mean, there's overlap, there's flexibility, just like anything else that grows. But still, we go through seasons of growth. And um, certainly God has, you know, the, he's the author of and the designer of all creation. And so he's put so many of his mysteries in the natural order. Jesus himself told the parables and um, it's, it's one of the main apostolic metaphors. That is, it's a symbol of an apostolic work to plant. And then the other main one is to build. And he uses both metaphors here. And so we're going to look at that. So Colossians 2 verse 6. Is that where I said? All right. So therefore, as you've received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him. Having been firmly rooted and now being built up in him and established in your faith, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude. So the first part that I identify here in this passage is the reception of Christ Jesus, the Lord, and then walking in him. I see that as stage one, the obvious stage 
that starts a church plant is when the gospel of King Jesus is proclaimed and the, there's a response of faith and people pledge their lives to Jesus. And we really unpacked the gospel last night, so I refer mostly to last night's talk about how uh, the, we need to be the church, uh, the, the authentic church, we need a revelation of Jesus as king. And we see the way he took his throne and became the supreme Lord of all creation by virtue of his humility and his servitude and his death. And he lowered himself. So that's the foundation. That's where authority comes from. Uh, and that's the vision we must have of Jesus as king is the, the, the Lord of all creation and the head of all things to the church. But having gotten that great majesty via his humility and laying down his life out of his passionate love for his people. So that's the gospel that saves us. It's also the gospel that models the life for us that creates the church. So let's, let's keep in mind those to whom Paul's speaking. He is speaking to a church that's already planted in the city. And in fact, he didn't plant this church. His colleague Epaphras did. So he's going back to them now with writing because they were in danger of embracing false teaching. Some already were. And so they needed to recalibrate. They needed to understand some of the basics again. So he's reminding them, as you've received Christ Jesus as Lord, so walk in them. So that reminds us, stage one is the proclamation of the gospel and people pledging their lives to Jesus. And sometimes even existing Christians have to recalibrate on that. You know, faith is not just something mental. It's a covenant with Jesus. <laughs> we pledge our lives. And if that's not the foundation, we're going to be hard pressed to build a church that's healthy. Jesus is the foundation, which implies for us covenant with him and our covenant with him, which is the, the, the first thing that happens. We ourselves as individuals must make covenant with Jesus. The last was it the last time I was here, I was talking about establishing the kingdom, not just demonstrating it. So that's important. Covenant establishes the kingdom. So Jesus performed a bunch of miracles, but he renounced the cities in which most of his miracles were done because they did not repent. Repentance is a turning to God and pledging covenant with him. So it's covenant that grounds the kingdom. We need more than just the miracles, though the miracles are non-negotiable. Anything the anointing does, I mean, the preaching of the kingdom and the miracles... But the, the purpose of God in those things is to harvest people and establish them as a work in that location. And so we establish the kingdom by covenant. First, individual covenant with God. But then second, covenant relationship with one another, which is organic. It's not, it's not just an outward commitment. It's the recognition that we're a family and then cultivating relationships as a family. A family is a natural covenantal group, right? I mean, my wife and I and our children, we have a covenant with one another. We're family. We're bound to one another. You know, if my son gets a little bit, like I've, I've said this before, but you know, I don't think Jake has heard this. I think he's the only one that hasn't been here and to hear me say this before. Maybe you haven't either. I'm sorry, but um, I talk about how family has a natural covenant, but we don't always transfer that to understand God's family that way. God's family is something more we attend <laughs> when it's convenient, like you were saying earlier, rather than as a family that we have some, we have some, you know, a connection, the, the kind of connection with people that creates uh, a family of, of covenant obligations. If my son gets tired of my wife's cooking and doesn't like my devotions, he doesn't go attend the Jones family down the street. <laughs> We're in covenant. Really, you don't just stop and go somewhere else. We're family, and when we enter That's in, good. when we maybe I haven't used that analogy here. Okay, well then I haven't done. It's just so it's so obvious to us in the natural. Even though you know there's lots of broken and dysfunctional families, we understand that, but still instinctively we know, and at least some a family that's that's somewhat healthy. There's this natural inclination where you're bound to one another with love. And yet we think totally different in God's family. And these things ought not to be. But when we do think, you know, embrace the biblical vision of covenantal relationship, then 
with one another, then that grounds the kingdom. So this receiving Jesus and so walking in him is is recognizing our covenant with him and with one another, which is foundational. Um, Just one more thing along these lines. There's this really cool story. Actually, it's just a reference in 1 Kings recording the building of the house of the Lord. They've had the tabernacle, but now in 1 Kings 6, you don't have to turn there, I'm just referring to it. But in 1 Kings 6, uh, the author tells us that 480 years after they left Egypt, Solomon began to build the house of the Lord, which is interesting, just the math of that, which is not my main point, but it's cool. Uh, 480 is 40 times 12. So it's 12 generations from their liberation, 12 generations out from when they were liberated from Egypt, Solomon began to build the house of the Lord. It's like now that they've been brought out, this building of the house is saying, we're going to be established in this land. I think to a degree, they were already established. They were in the land. God had given it to them, but now they're building the house. And that's the son of King David, the first great king. His son is going to build the house, which is the establishment of God's kingdom on the earth. And so that's our goal is to establish God's kingdom. And how do you do that? You build the house of the Lord. First Peter chapter two calls each one of us a living stone built on the foundation, the chief corner, which is Christ Jesus. But we're built together, not just on him, but connected with one another. We are the house of the Lord. Welcome. All right, so now check this out. In one verse in that passage, I think it's verse 6 or 7. So anyway, if you read it. 1 Kings chapter 6. You, yeah, no problem. If you need to rearrange, this is an informal meeting. Just talk and work it out. You're going to get food? So, and you don't want to miss this analogy. So listen from the other room, Jake. All right. So check this out. It was talking about the cutting of the stones and we could pause if you want. I'm not. I was just telling Colossians two. Yeah. You're referencing first Kings. Yes, I am. I'm referencing first Kings six, but we're in Colossians two. All right. So when they would cut the stones, it says, and I think verse seven, the, the, the blocks, for the temple of the Lord, they would cut them out of the quarry, like in perfect measurement at the quarry. So that when they brought them to the site for the temple, no metal was used to put the stones together. They fit together perfectly. It's just a great analogy. At the quarry, the word is um, that the, the stones were perfected or finished. Your translation might say prepared. At the quarry, which is that is part of the idea. But but the, the, the point is that they were molded at the quarry. So they were cut out of the larger rock and they were shaped according to the measurements they knew they needed at the site. So that when they got them to the site, they fit together perfectly. And there wasn't the sound of metal when this when the house of the Lord was being built. There was like a holy hush because such care was taken when the stones were cut out. That once they got to the place where they're going to be built together as the house of the Lord, they just fit together perfectly. And it's a really cool analogy for building the house of the Lord ourselves. But if you'll notice, we have to have the idea that I'm my life. I'm letting the Lord forge me, not just so that I can be like Jesus, but so that I can fit together with the people. And we can make a house together because it's not just about me being a good Christian. God, that's not God's ultimate purpose. God's eternal purpose is that a whole house fit together of stones that they become together like Jesus. So when I'm in prayer or I'm allowing the troubles of life to forge me and I'm, you know, I'm going to God like Jesus in the garden so that I can respond to conflict with grace or whatever it is that I'm allowing God to develop in me, in my good character. I'm not just thinking I need to be like Jesus. I'm thinking this is for my family too. This is for them. I'm becoming a better person so I can be a better contributor to the house of God so that I could edify my brothers and sisters 
so that we together can be a great house of the Lord and take his presence into our city and have an impact for the gospel and harvest more to go through the same purpose. Those stones were not cut out just so they could be really cool stones. Because I'll tell you what, when they were cut out and perfected at the quarry, I'll bet you they were attractive. But the whole point was that they were cut so perfectly there was so that they would fit together over at the house. And that was the whole goal. So it's, it, I'm not just being matured for me. I'm being matured for y'all, for the family, yeah. right? That's and it's just, again, it, it, it happens in the family. Our, our good character, you know, me as a husband, as a dad, I mean, the better person I am, so to speak, the more I allow God's grace to work in me, the better off the people around me are. It's like the fruit of the Spirit is fruit. You eat fruit. You're nourished by it. So if I have good character, you're going to be nourished by it. It's not just for me. It's for the others. It's not just for you. It's for us. So we have to think covenantally that God's working on me for the sake of his people. And then that structure together becomes witness to the surrounding area of the city, the county, whatever. So it's interesting in 1 Corinthians 14 that Paul says when a person speaks in tongues, he constructs himself. And the word there is construction language. You know, we read it, it says edifies himself, and that's construction language. It doesn't just mean encouragement. It means you're getting built. You're getting fortified. But Paul doesn't want you speaking in tongues in a public setting unless it's interpreted, because no one gets anything out of it. But he says, when you pray in a tongue, you're edified. But when you prophesy, you edify the the church. You're constructing the temple. So it's like the tongues work at the quarry and prepare people to come together and prophesy so they can build a house when they're together, which is what Paul's saying in 1 Corinthians 14. That's what his concern is. He's not just correcting the Corinthians. He's telling them how to build. Build. Tongues works. But it works in your life to cut you to the right shape to fit in with the people. And then when you're together, your prophecies have power. So there's a whole mindset there. It's like my, even my personal prayer life. I'm going to invest part of my personal prayer life to make me the kind of person that's more useful and edifying when I'm with the others. It's just, to me, a very beautiful picture. And it's part of the, the whole covenantal way of life that even when I'm allowing God to work on me, it's for the sake of others, which is what God is all about. It's always for the other. And yet we get our own personal joy fulfilled when we keep these commandments, when we lay down our lives for one another. And so that is really our own ultimate happiness also. So just a couple of practical things along those lines before we go to stage two. And that is, I really encourage you to pray in the Spirit as generously as possible. It builds you up. I mean, it really does make you feel good and make you sensitive to the Spirit. But you're also preparing yourself to be a stronger contributor in the house of the Lord. And if you do it with that mentality, you'll find yourself more sensitive to what the Spirit's saying prophetically when you come together. You might even want to say, look, I'm going to take 10 minutes a day or 10 hours a day or anything in between and just invest praying in the spirit with your mind locked into the church. You know, like, Lord, I'm praying in the spirit. My eyes are on you, but I'm asking you through this to prepare me, prepare me to help build when we're together. It's just a great way of thinking, and I believe it's effective praying, too. And then when you're together, the secret is prophecy builds If we prophesy well, we build the church. And that's just quoting scripture. All right. Well, that's it. That's all I have. I'm going to take an offering now. No, I'm just kidding. That's just stage one. (laughs) Yes, sir. It's amazing right there. In itself, right there. And it, it comes with a couple of practical bits of advice. I mean, you know. The, the things we're talking about are large and beautiful and super spiritual. Well, what do we do? Well, you know, just let's accumulate some habits and build from there. One thing we can do is dedicate ourselves in private to praying in the spirit in tongues more than we are or focus it more. And then when we come together, just be sensitive to the spirit to prophesy. But one, one time for one, like a three month period, I just ask people, hey, just dedicate a certain amount of time. Uh, to just praying in the spirit every day 
for the sake of building this work, building yourself to come together to build the work. And sometimes just simple stuff like that can go a long way. Let's do it. Yeah. I'll second that. I mean, you, you know, one of the things that I figured would come up when we started asking questions is, you know, establish a few habits you're doing together that just, that's what you do. Like, um, you know, Andrew's asking you to pray for the, you know, the, the other people in the church. What? Individual people. Yes. In your own prayer time, pray for the folks here. So, that, so you could you know, establish that as a habit that you're working on. You can add tongues to that. But then also what you do when you meet. How you meet, when you meet. You know, you're not fully established as a church yet, I would say. You're, you're working toward it. But you could work on a few like family traditions, customs, even if they're just seasonal, that help put some of these things into action. You don't have to like, try to do all of this at once. Pick in the spirit what he's saying to you now and do those things, like the little mechanics of what you're about, which you already have. So maybe God's going to add something. Maybe you'll keep it for a while, just whatever it is you're doing. And so here's something else to think about. To pray in tongues privately toward the end goal of being more effective in the public setting to prophesy. Now, I don't know how churches can do this without meeting as a family, but only as like in a conference setting. I like the conference setting with the preacher and the band. I like that, but I don't know how to fulfill this unless you meet as a family. I'm not sure I want to know how. But the other stuff is good to punctuate, put the icing on the cake. But this is the cake. A whole cake made of icing hurts your teeth. Keep the cake, the cake, and the icing, the icing. Nothing wrong with the icing. Just keep it the icing. The cake is the cake. So I'm trying to work on the cake here. I hope you are okay with that analogy. Now, then Paul says, right, and we're back to Colossians 2, verse 6, uh, 7 now. Having been firmly rooted. Now, I see this as stage two of this planting of the Lord. Epaphras planted this church. He led them to the Lord. Now, listen, the way the apostles operated in the first century and the way they operate in any century when they operate in God's wisdom is, You know, as soon as people get saved, they start to get discipled and brought together as a family. They don't just go attend somewhere. They begin to learn how to relate to one another as a new family. So Epaphras already did that. So Paul speaks of this in the past. You've been rooted. And by the way, when he says you have been rooted, this is plural. He's not speaking generically to each person individually. Most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time when Scripture is speaking to people, he speak, it, God is speaking through Scripture to the group. There's always a group mentality. It's always us. It's never just me. And that's what he's doing here. He's consciously speaking to the church. He's not just speaking to individuals. I am rooted and grounded. Well, amen, I am. I should take that personally. That's good. But recognize he's speaking to the church as a whole. Right? Even Jesus teaches us to pray, our Father. There's this consciousness of the larger tribe the larger family, both locally and translocally, when he teaches us to pray. So that's what we should be conscious of too here. So um, at this stage, and I believe this is the stage you are in right now as a group. You're getting rooted. Now, usually it should start to happen right away with salvation. You start to get disciples going. you, You put them into groups. After a while, you could appoint elders over them, but they're immediately a new kind of family. Um, What we're doing is kind of we're already saved and we're returning to more of a family style. So that's fine. So there's kind of a separation between stages there, but that's all right. We're going to consciously activate stage two. So this is a vulnerable time, but it's vulnerable in the right sense. It's not because there's lurking danger or and even if there is, God's protecting us. But it's because the planting is new. And it's getting put into nice, good soil. And you've got to let those roots get down there. And so that's the stage that we're in. And when I was praying about this stage for you guys, I saw you being planted in something like a, a, a small makeshift greenhouse that was just for you. Like a um, plexiglass little protective encasing. That, and the Lord was tending to you. And so you're protected from the elements because you're so small. Again, it's just the stage. 
It's not a negative. It's, that's, it's just life. Because our goal is this massive oak that's like immovable. And it's got all these branches and leaves and fruit mixing the kind of tree it is, you know, providing shade and fruit. And, you know, it doesn't need a little plexiglass house. But for now, it's this tender shoot that's just beginning and the Lord's protecting you. And so you're, I think what you want to do is, is do what the, the Lord gives you to do to get rooted. That's what you're, you're doing right now. Okay, the goal is to be established, but you're not in the stage yet where you're talking like what all that to me, what all that implies. You're in the rooting stage. So so what does that mean here? Well, roots go down into the soil. So I see you as learning, okay, to abide in the depths of God together. Learn how to get the nutrients out of the soil as a plant, not just as individuals. But uh, as a group, you're learning to abide in Christ as a group specifically. And I'll say this even later on my last point when I'm going to speak a little bit prophetically for you guys, or I'm just going to speak prophetically. But the voice of the Lord is is important to you and it's important to the Lord. But you have a real strength in perceiving his voice. Well, learn to do it together. Put together a mosaic in different meetings even if it, it's not what your, you know, your master's at now, this is something that's a goal, to hear God together. This one says this, this one says this, this one says this. I don't know how those things go together. Wait a minute. No, I see it. There's a passage of scripture that puts them all together. I, the Lord just showed me. And, and then you get the counsel of the Lord. Or maybe someone was off or it wasn't quite time for it. And that's okay. You judge the prophecies. And you don't have to be masters now. You're a new planting. You're, you're, I mean, you're, I'm sure you're great at it, but the point is you're learning to hear God together. That's one of your, your uh, uh, assignments. So it's a strength. Yeah, it is one of your strengths, but you've got to learn how to do it. Uh, so it's your assignment also right now. Uh, what else am I saying here about being rooted? Oh, and also, of course... At this stage is when you're becoming more of an identifiable group. To be rooted means, yes, we are going to recognize this is a specific group. Doesn't mean you won't grow. And the intention is to grow and even to multiply. And maybe, you know, there might be some day where like four of you are called to go start something close by. And you could even that that, things can change. That's all in the Lord's hands. You know, man-made buildings and man-made church splits are bad. But when God splits things up, he's just multiplying. And that's okay. You know, even families have people grow up and go move and start their own family. So to become identifiable doesn't mean you're going to be all withdrawn and become cultic. But, but for this stage, you have to experience it as an identifiable group. And so it's a time to gel together as a group. So part of the rooting is finding your identity together. And that just takes time. That doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen when just someone comes in and prophesies. You got to connect. You have to spend time together. You have to hear God together. You have to hang out. You have to get comfortable with one another and then go through a couple of times maybe where you're not so comfortable with one another or some. And then you overcome that and you, you keep it healthy and in the spirit. And it's just part of the process. But you want to gel as a group. You know, you may not be ready to disciple, you know, t- 10 major drug dealers. Maybe you are. I'm not saying don't do that. That's between you and the Lord. But as a tender planting, you might be more effective at that in several months to a year than you are now because you want... You know, sometimes slow is fast. Just the development of something small might translate to something massive later that happens so much more quickly if you didn't take the time to develop this. It's like practicing as a band. You don't just throw the guys up there on stage. And even friendships, like even in sports, the friendships oftentimes help them play together on the field and, of course, practicing in the sense of camaraderie. And it just energizes you to work hard and be diligent and... And then they're good on the field. Well, so we need our practice too, which is, our, which is developing in our friendships and in hearing God together. All right. Um, also this, yeah, this image of being rooted. Paul mentions it again near the end of Ephesians 3. And that has to do with love, being rooted and grounded in love. So that's all part of the camaraderie is learning to love one another. Because for Christians to do that 
um, intentionally and devotedly as the church is rather rare. To develop in love together as a church, intentionally, relationally, as if it's a real holy thing that God inhabits, is actually rare. We're not used to it. Even, you know, for, for me, I know, I, I, I speak these things, I believe them, I practice them, but I'm still getting used to seeing church that way and developing relationships that are healthy in the spirit. Well, the new planting, the, the stage of getting rooted is part of learning how to love one another step by step as you get to know one another and hear God's voice together. Uh, also being rooted, um, and we've, I already mentioned this at the other stage, but the baptism in the Holy Spirit roots us. It roots us into the ground of God's love, the soil of God's love. So if you're not baptized in the Holy Spirit, I encourage you to get baptized in the Spirit. Get prayer until you do, or you might just need to speak forth. You just may, may need to step forth in faith. Or if you have been and haven't prayed in tongues a lot recently, uh, to get back to that point before, just uh, begin to be more generous with praying in the Spirit. Because that whole baptism in the Spirit grounds us together too. So I'm overlapping with my other point, but I have it written twice. You remember when um, Philip was in Samaria and performing miracles and people were getting saved and even Simon the magician was interested in what was going on. But then when the apostles heard about it, they came and laid hands on people and they got filled with the Holy Spirit. So there was something about the presence of the apostles and the baptism in the Spirit that helped them to be rooted. So there's, so there's your baptism in the Spirit, but there's also the outside help that helps you to get rooted. So this, this is the stage you're at. Is that good? Questions or comments? I'm about ready to move to stage three. I'm going so fast, I can't hardly even keep up with myself. Not really, I'm not rushing, but we're moving along quite nicely. <coughs> One other thing to say that's almost random, but I have it here in my notes. As you're being planted, you're a new planting of the Lord. Keep a city vision, okay? Larger picture seasonally, but also larger picture geographically. You're here as a planting in Jasper, and I'm sure beyond. So have a, a, a bigger picture mentality. You know, when the way we're trying to do things at home, I really believe is, for the most part, the biblical way. And if someone were to, to, to debate me on that, I'd say, well, I mean, it would be friendly, but I'd say, no, I see it differently, and I would... I would maintain my ground because it's what I feel the scripture is saying, right? But that doesn't mean that we're not serving other people who do it differently. There's other saints in our city who are precious. They might practice church differently, but they're the army of God. And I want to be supportive of them and I want to serve them, even if I may not agree with every little thing the way they do things. And of course, we're serving the harvest of our city. So even what you're doing, if you feel it's a good, pure, biblical vision, remember you're doing it for the sake of the larger picture. Also, you're doing it for the sake of your city, both the saints and the unsaved, not just for this planting. You're for the others. And yeah, okay. Just wanted to put that out there. I'll leave it at that. Hey, stage three. Now you're in stage two the way I see it. And that's going to take some time. So we, I'll even come back to that and prophesy a bit. But um, we're now going to leave the stage you're in and speak into the future. Is that okay? Or do you want to yeah, talk about okay. stage two anymore? No, no. All right. So this stage three is in, again, verse seven, as the rest of this is. You're being built up in him. Now that's present tense. So for Paul and Epaphras, for the Colossians in verse seven at the beginning, they were already firmly rooted. So they were past that stage. Okay, you guys are getting firmly rooted. It's all clean and pure. It's this little, precious little planting. But you're at that stage. But then the next stage, which is an ongoing thing, it's the next stage, and it's also constant, if you can allow me to mix that. There, you're being built up in him. So that's stage three, where the plant is gaining strength and standing on its own. It's even able to handle certain levels of weather. The little planting couldn't even handle a normal rain shower, so the Lord put that glass thing over it. 
Um, now this one can handle pretty much normal weather. And if, I know that you know, I'm not a farmer or something. I'm sure some of my natural analogies aren't right. So little plants can handle normal weather. But, but let, we're just pretending some can't. And I'm sure some can't. But you're right. I mean, you have to, you have, to have them in a, in a shield most of the time. And depending on the plant, too. Like if it's, yeah. So I'll, 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 I'll stick with it then. But now stage three is like you're able to handle things you couldn't handle before. There may still be a stake in the ground helping you. You're getting tall, maybe into your adolescence. Um, so you're able to handle more, but um, you're becoming stronger. Uh, this happens with the deliberate discipling of one another. That may take on different forms, just the group, ironing, iron sharpening iron. Uh, men in smaller groups, women in smaller groups, just meeting together sometimes and talking through the issues that you're going through and applying the word and praying for one another, just exhorting one another. Like you said yesterday, even generally, you might want to do something specific just to keep encouraging and exhorting within the different ebb and flow of life, applying the word in a living way, praying in the spirit and seeing breakthrough together. I remember when we got refreshed, the Spirit of God just came. And it was something like a spirit of revival, but I would call it more of a refreshing at our church in Wisconsin. Wisconsin. But before that, that's why I was a Cubs fan, because before that I was in Chicago and I took the Cubs with me from there. But that's neither here nor there. I, I, I was in Wisconsin. And when the spirit of refreshing hit, you know, people, everybody related to God and one another differently when the Spirit of God became manifest. We just, I mean, we can take the issues of life and take them to the Lord sometimes with tears. Sometimes it's demonic. It's an attack. It's not God, but God can fix it. And then we, we become more like Jesus in our capacity to trust God and walk with God and see God intervene. And it's just like I said last night, when life beats on us and we get some wounds, when we let God heal them into scars, not only are we stronger and that's character, but we can help other people. And that's just what happened with this brother. And so when the building up part, we're continuing to, there's teaching, there's exhortation, but we're doing it prayerfully through the real issues of life. And as we see God meet us together to fix things and deliver us, we just become more like Jesus. We just become more given to faith. And character and patience. All these virtues that so often lack in our superficial society among the church. We become tempered and sweet because we've walked through relational things or big problems. And we've seen God come to pass, uh, come to the rescue and fix it or deliver us. And, and then we change. We become conformed to the image of Jesus. So we need to pray for and exhort one another along these lines so that we will grow and be discipled. Now, you understand I'm not touching on everything the New Testament teaches about church. There's teachers, there's pastors, there's elders, there's the saints equipped for ministry. There's all kinds of things we could be talking about. I'm just trying to put a few things in you where you'll be deliberate about discipling one another, especially when you get to that stage where you're, you're, you're kind of launching forth. Well, what would that look like? Well, that maybe we could talk about that later. But there's, you know, the sky's the limit. There's different things you can do. The point is we want to have the mentality to do it. Right? All right. So, all right. So it's also during that time that people, not only we're getting discipled, but we're getting released and activated in our gifts. Okay. We can't be built up by just one person talking all the time. Hopefully I'm not contradicting what I'm doing here, but I'm not here all the time. Um, <laughs> you, you know, if I were, if, if this were my group, I would be doing this sometimes and I'd be then having you guys learn how to prophesy and contribute, you know, and some will be more vocal than others because of the gift sets, but we want to recognize and activate people in their gifts. Some people will prophesy. Some people will be more given to serving. So whatever it is, some people can teach and they'll, they'll have to be encouraged to give some short teachings and then they're capable of longer teachings later on. But we want to recognize and develop and encourage one another's gifts, leave room for some mistakes at times and cover one another. So that even if someone who's very prophetic and goes off mixing their own thoughts in the prophecy, 
you're like, dude, you're, you're prophetic. You, you mixed some things. We want to help you sort that out. But, um, but you have a real gift. We want you to keep it up. Don't be embarrassed. You know, just because you got a little frustrated last time you prophesied or whatever. So we want to activate and just encourage along. Sometimes prophetic people mix their own frustrations with their prophecies, especially when they're learning. That's just the example I'm giving. I, I told you about my nephew, Max. Did I tell that story? Little Max. The cous- his siblings and cousins weren't letting him swing on a swing. They weren't giving him a turn. So he runs up to his dad, who's some distance away. And he goes, Dad, they won't let me, they won't give me a turn to swing on the swing. So his dad, Tim, says, all right, you t- go tell them that I said to give you a turn on the swing. So Max turns around and screams at the kids, Dad says he's sick of all of you. <laughs> <laughs> Like, no, no, Max, I didn't say that. I did tell you something, and I did authorize you to say it, but you mixed in your own frustrations. It's like he, he took the fact that the father spoke to him, and the father gave him a kind of gentle... He, the father did speak to him, and the father did empower him, and the father gave him a message to relay. But Max was a little too ticked off to say just that. He wanted to vent himself. So he took the father's authority and set, mixed in his own thoughts. Well, you know, as Max gets older, he'll be able to distinguish that a little bit better. And it's the same thing with the use of our gifts. But we should still encourage one another. When there's mixture, we'll, we'll help one another get pure without um, being critical or picky. Some things you'll even let go a little bit if it wasn't really defiling or dangerous and maybe talk private. You know, the, the point is, you know, we're not going to be perfect. There's room to grow, but we have to help one another do it, Right. And, um, yeah, in this process, too, we want to be making new disciples. Maybe that starts happening in stage three. Who knows? could even happen in stage two. You just want to still protect the work that God's just starting. Stage four, and this is, you know, this is down the line, but it's this last phrase here. You're being built up and established in your faith. So the establishment is when the planting gets big and strong. Its roots are deep, like big, giant tree roots. You know, trees go down often as high as they go up, right? That's established. We had a bad old storm um, in midsummer. It was shock. I had no idea it was coming. Usually I'm at least checking the weather. I had no idea this one was coming. It wasn't because of the hurricane. It just was this bad electric storm with very high winds. We have a lot of trees on our property now, a lot, probably too many. And... um tall trees. And I looked out front, I went out under the, the, the patio there and the sky was all like green and wind was blowing. And I did not think these trees could move like this. It was scary. I thought, man, we're in trouble. They were bending like violently, like they were having some kind of, you know, weird fight among themselves. It was like, man, that is intense. And it was, you know, the wind and it almost seemed like a tornado, but it, it wasn't um, it, like there could have been one coming. But I could not believe how much these trees bent, but they stayed. They didn't get uprooted. They were still there later that evening, the next day to this day, big, strong trees with all their branches and leaves because they're established. Ain't no storm going to uproot them, and throw them out. And um, that's the goal. Because the tree that's that established, not only is it not moving, it's having influence, right? It's providing shade, it's bearing fruit. So when you're established in your city, you're not just immovable, but you're having a massive kind of impact that's not going away. Paul told the Romans, I want to come to you and I want to impart a spiritual gift to you so that you might be established. That's in chapter 1 and chapter 16, because he wrote that letter then to show them what it took to be established, the gospel and then covenantal relationships. And then in the 16th chapter, he says, the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. You're going to take dominion in your area when you enter into the kind of church vision the Bible puts before you. When you're established, you enter into that, you have dominion over the principality there. 
And you'll have that impact. You'll have that open door to make gospel progress in the city. That's what being established looks like. That's what it does. There's a great verse along these lines. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Uh, Again, if you'll notice, the end of the letter, after Paul had to re-gospel them and instruct them how to relate to one another, to the cross, to Jesus, and to work it out practically. But he closes the letter basically by saying, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. So you have the two images together there. The negative, meaning you're not being moved. And the positive, you're abounding in the work of the Lord. That's what being established looks like. You can't be moved. Persecution or trouble or trials or even dry seasons, you're not moved. And at the same time, you're having a powerful supernatural gospel impact on your city. It's the John 15 abiding, bearing fruit. Your prayers get answered, which was what Jesus said. If you abide in me, my words abide in you. Ask whatever you wish, and it shall be done. And then that's related to the bearing of fruit. So powerful prayers come out of being established. An effective disciple-making service with supernatural influence in your city. Amen. And finally, let me just say that as I was praying for you, I just got a few thoughts I feel from the Lord. And they might seem a little bit random, but one of the things I really felt was to tell you that the joy of the Lord is your strength. I just see joy in this house. I feel like you have a joy. And yet I feel like you're going to have more joy. I just kept feeling joy for you. J-O-I, 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 joy, joy, joy. I just, and the joy of the Lord is your strength. So I encourage you to enjoy this process that you're embarking on. Enjoy it. Think about the one you're coming to meet together with. Think about one another fondly and enjoy your prayer meetings. Enjoy the Lord's Supper. Have a good time. Um, Enjoy what you know the Lord is going to do. Enjoy what the Lord is doing. Give yourself permission to be happy. I believe it's the foundation of kingdom life. Happy are the poor in spirit. Happy are those who mourn. Happy are the meek. Happy, 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 happy. All right? Oh, hi. Enjoy the Lord. Enjoy the process. Enjoy the Lord's Supper. See the value of what you're doing and realize that it's worth it. Just waiting for an amen. Amen. Yeah. I knew it it would come. I knew I'd get an amen. 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 I'm waiting for an amen. No, I mean, Oh, um, see the value of what you're doing and know that it's all worth it. Amen. Amen. Yeah, there you go. And the joy of the Lord will be your strength. Also, I feel like you're in a season of breakthrough. I really do. What does that mean? Uh, That's the thing about, no, that's the thing about prophetic. You don't have to explain it. You say, I don't know. (laughs) It's the prophecy. Um, it's just my sense. Now, part of it, I do, I do feel like the Lord is, is saying this, but it's also my perception of being around a little bit of the history. I feel like the Lord has really turned things in a certain direction decisively for you all, for you guys in particular. But you're working to do this, so it's for everybody. So I feel like there, it doesn't come without bumps and bruises, but it, it is still the larger picture is... Um, You're turning like a plane is making a turn. It was a little bit of a violent turn. So you got jostled and even hurt. You know, like a a bruised rib and it's like sore. But you're in the bigger plane that's turning. Um, So you're uh, you're in some kind of spiritual breakthrough coming into destiny. It's happening now. It's not about to happen. But it will increase. So keep that in mind. Ellie, um, because I feel like the Lord's telling me that you're very special. <laughs> of course, you probably know that, but I feel like the Lord told me that and that certainly the enemy has tried to resist you, but God will raise you up just because he just raises the dead. It's what he does and um, really is going to develop you into a, a, a powerful and you are, but he's going to develop you into an, a powerful person. So really keep hold of that. He's growing you. 
And sometimes, you know, he has got to use what the enemy does against us. Now, God doesn't cause things that the enemy is doing, but God will take it and turn it towards something better. So keep that faith. Keep your eyes on Jesus because you are in this season of overall breakthrough. But it, it's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to come with bumps and bruises. But in the end, you'll be tempered and more effective at everything God's called you to do. And you'll be able to look back and say, you know, that was hard. But I have a testimony. I have a testimony. Especially when you get that full breakthrough. It's like, I... And then you, you'll, you have gone through that. You can't learn that in a book. You've got to go through it. But then on the other end of it, it bears powerful fruit and gives you great joy and a kind of thanksgiving you couldn't have otherwise. So remember that. I already said it before and now officially, prophetically, just the voice of the Lord is clear to you and God rejoices to make his voice clear to you. You know, we all should value the voice of the Lord, but you have an effective kind of corporate ability to hear. And so cultivate that. I just see this big V in the middle of you like victory, but also it's the voice, not the TV show, which I've not even seen, but I know that it's there. And, um, you know, people sing and whatever and however they do that. But I just see, see you hearing the voice of the Lord and then speaking with his voice. Psalm 29, the voice of the Lord changes everything. It it makes the world go round. It makes deer's calve and the, 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 the cedars of Lebanon to break down. So just seize hold of his voice and then you'll be a voice. And of course, you know, I know that you have good gifts and words of knowledge and, and in healing. And so continue to cultivate that because your city will need that. It's, there's a lot of weaknesses and needs, even though we had talked about that. I felt to share that again and, um, stay the course. Just keep, keep up the good work. Don't rush. Stay in the rest and don't lag behind either. That's Romans 12, 11. Don't, what is it? Don't lag behind in diligent, in diligence, but be fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. But at the same time, don't rush and get in the flesh. We've got to make something happen. Come on. It's like everything's in the spirit. Everything's in the spirit. L- let the spirit be tangible. Okay. His presence is always here, but there's that manifest when we feel it and he's making himself more known to us and really cultivate that tangible activity of the spirit. Be spirit people. The end. I'm done. Do you have any questions?